Welcome to another episode of Destination Linux Podcast. Welcome to episode 31 of Destination Linux. Today we're going to cover Ubuntu Mate 1710 Alpha 2. A couple changes with GNOME and Ubuntu, Ubuntu LTS, and a lot more stuff. Back with me is Ryan. What's going on, man? I'm having a blast. Thanks for having me back again. Again, you're back. I know. It's crazy. <laughs> so what's been up with you this week, man? Well, I've been making lots of friends this week on my channel. As you know, we uh, did the Sparky Linux review. <laughs> <laughs> I did watch that. <laughs> yeah. Some creative lines in there, man. Let me tell you. Yeah. So um, it, it's been an interesting week for Linux for me. There's been a lot of user requested videos to check out XYZ distributions. And uh, I definitely found some that were very interesting. And then there's the Sparky Linux, which I'm sure... Uh, some people love, and I get that they love it and respect that, but it definitely wasn't something I enjoyed at all. And uh, so we got that video out there doing some new stuff with, uh, you know, my channel kind of does everything geek. So we'll be doing some cracked iPad repairs and some other videos that I've been filming this weekend. My four year old smashed one to pieces. So oh I'll show you how to go gosh. in there and fix those up and save yourself another three, four hundred dollars. So all kinds of cool stuff going on out there. And of course, Rocket League with you, your channel. <laughs> that was awesome, dude. I'm that sorry. Was so much fun, man. <laughs> we didn't get many views, but uh it doesn't matter. It was so much fun to do. It was yeah. nice. So talk to me. Sparky Linux. What's going on with it? Well, you know, I Sparky Linux was recommended again. So I went in there with the full most of the the distributions that people recommend to me are fantastic. That's how I found Manjaro and fell in love with it. But uh, Sparky Linux, LXQT, KDE version as well, uh, it just is sloppy. And it feels like they have a lot of great ideas implemented, like their software centers and things, but a lot of the features didn't work. Um, and then the, and you can see that in the video, and then there's just the overall user experience, you know, part of the industry I work in, we always talk about build your customer experience first and then build your technology to support that. And what I kind of felt like with Sparky is they've got all this cool technology, like rolling distribution and all these different things they've done, you know, searchable menus between the desktop environment, but nothing feels like focused on a full experience for the user. It's more like, hey, guess what? You can use 16 different desktop environments in our distribution, but none of them really are meant <laughs> to work in our distribution. <laughs> and you can see that when you go to KDE and yeah, it works. And you've got that KDE experience with the menu system and the searchable and all that, but none of the text is showing up, right? You can see all the text was like blurred out and things like that with just random issues. So I was very surprised because I actually had really high expectations for it. And I think they have something really unique there, uh, but they've got to go back and look at that user experience and say, what is it we're trying to give besides being a lightweight distro? There's lots of lightweight distros out there, MX-16, all this stuff. What are you trying to give the end user experience wise with this platform? I mean, everything from the wallpaper looked like a zoomed in, piece of construction paper to me like it's just everything <laughs> just did not so you're, fit my you're not life. a fan of Alanis Morissette huh <laughs> <laughs> I said it's the whole desktop looks so 90s it should have a wallpaper of Alanis Morissette <laughs> um but you know and I and I hate hating on that because I know a lot of people probably volunteer their time and work hard on it and I could see the work it's there if you, they would just kind of connect it all into and maybe it's that giving too many choices for different things and not really having a path for what you want that user experience to be. Or maybe it's just not meant for me. Right. <laughs> and that's the end result, you know. Right. Maybe it's meant for people. You know, there's still people that love XFCE as, as you know, right. for me, that's not for me. It looks too old and not as modern, but people use it and they love it. So maybe there's a a certain percentage of people out there who like Sparky Linux, but I've actually never tried it. So I can't, all I've done is watch your video. On it. I'm sure <laughs> so. I didn't encourage you. No, no, you didn't. <laughs> Unless you're a huge Alanis Morissette fan. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, let's move on to some news about some new releases as well. So right. Ubuntu Mate 1710 Alpha 2 has been released. And they have included a lot of things to... And we'll look at their... Let's look at their webpage for a second. So they have uh, pretty much went for the Unity 7 refugees, as they call them. So... They have They're content- going for all two of those customers. <laughs> no, you wouldn't I'm believe. I'm teasing. <laughs> um, yeah, well, we bust on Unity, but uh, I yeah. actually grew to like Unity a little bit before. Um, I did too. So, But they have concentrated their efforts on adding features that will bring in those Unity users. And the one thing that I thought was awesome about it is they're concentrating their efforts and they're able to make, for example, their mutiny panel layout work like a Unity desktop without alienating the people that already use and love Ubuntu Mate the way they want to use it. You know, they have it set up a certain way. Within one click, you can make it look like Unity, make it act like Unity, or you can just keep what you have and still use it. So I think it's the best of both worlds. Right. I think this is a great example when we're talking about that user experience where in looking at the screenshots of this, I didn't get a chance to play with it. Uh, But looking at the screenshots of some of the things that they're adding in here with their menu systems and their, their uh, what they call their quick HUD search searching and things is they're focusing on that user experience as a whole. It almost feels like when you look at the screenshots and, I think you got to play with it that that's their main goal is customer experience out versus kind of what I was talking about with other distributions where it's look at all this tech we have, but nothing really works together. Like, right. Well, they are concentrating on that. And like I said, they've had a lot of features to the, the mutiny part of it, uh, which include the global menus. And, you know, you can get global menus on GNOME. You can get them on KDE if you add extensions and you do a lot of customizing. But they still don't quite work as well as they did in Unity. These work pretty darn good. And I was never really a big fan of global menus, I have to admit. But after using Unity for a little bit, I got used to them being there. And it was almost like I saw the benefit of them. So they do work really well. Um, They have added super key support. So to all of the menus areas, Mate Tweak, and the Brisk menu. So that is definitely worked with the super key. And mm-hmm. something you mentioned is the the HUD, the heads up display. Yeah. So it looks super fast going through the menu, being able to get to the area that you want to get to. And it, ultimately, and that that's a big deal that I think a lot of distros, it seems that I've tried have, have missed is that searchability. For instance, Sparky Linux has no file folder manager by default for you to get into your system files. You can add it, but it's not there. And so, I mean, what are you doing with your PC that you don't need quick access to that? For instance, in KDE, obviously you have your folder icon on your left-hand side, right next to your menu button by default where you can get into your files. But also being able to search in there, get to your tools quickly when you're really using Linux, not just installing it and browsing the web when you're really using it for graphic design or programming you need to get through your menus snappy and quick and fast and have the shortcuts that make this kind of a superior experience to windows or mac and i mean that's where linux really shines and i see that they're adding a lot of that and that's super cool to see how quick they're moving in this in this gif that they have of them kind of going through that hud moving through the menu system of program very easy Well, that is the one area where the alpha release kind of lacked in. And Mm -hmm. for the most part, the alpha release uh, didn't crash. Uh, All of the features worked really well, except for in the area of the the HUD. Now, the HUD itself, when it's pulled up, and you can pull it up by uh, the super key and alt, when it's pulled up, it works great. But I noticed that it only came up about a quarter of the time that I actually hit that key combo. So I don't know if it had something to do with my specific hardware, my specific keyboard, or if it's just a bug in the alpha release, but that is the one area where it didn't perform as well as it could have. 
and you need that. You need it to work every time for it to be useful because otherwise you can't rely on it, right? But it is alpha, so it's fair to say that uh, that's, that's one of those ones where you want to go to their bug report and kind of let them know. Yep. Get this fixed or else. <laughs> so it also, they updated the indicators for all of the system tray applets mm -hmm. uh, to work better. They have added into Mate Tweak that you can now name a custom layout and save it. So when you're switching between layouts, it'll pop up an, a message, a warning to say that this is a destructive operation. So if you have started out with the the default layout and you have changed one or two applets, then you go to switch layouts, it, you'll lose all of the changes unless you save it first. And now you can save it and name it as well. So that's one added feature, which is really nice. Uh, they did have their community wallpaper contest and added some new wallpapers and like a ton of other bug fixes and hopefully they else. get the construction paper zoomed in uh, <laughs> wallpaper. I love that one. Uh, let me ask you when you were doing the install, this is a problem that I've run into now. I've spent the week going through several different distributions. And one thing I noticed is some distributions give you a direct way to turn off the bootloader or grub installation, for instance, so that you're not overriding. For instance, Manjaro is very picky with its grub. Like yep. you can just, you can install stuff. Uh, and if it, if it installs a new version of grub, Manjaro is not going to work. It's just, I mean, you probably, you can get it to work, but it's a major pain. So it's just better not to install that operating systems. Grub. And what I've noticed with a lot of these installers, including Ubuntu Mate, is there was no clear way for me to go in there and tell it, do not install Grub, do not, you know, because I just want you to install the operating system there and I'll go into my own Grub and update it. But they don't right. give you those options. Whereas MX-16, for instance, is one of the best installer implementations I saw actually at the very end of installing it on your hard drive says, hey, do you want to install Grub? Yes or no? <laughs> I mean, it was beautiful because it just makes it so simple. How do you get around that issue? Well, I don't usually get around it. I usually just overwrite the grub and let the new... And, and that's pretty bad on my test drive because I have four partitions and they all have different operating systems that I'm installing. So the Ubiquity installer does not, I don't believe, has that option. But then mm -hmm. you go to other ones, like you said, MX-16. And I believe uh, the Nemesis installer with Revenge OS has that option as well to not install grub. But I don't really get around it. I just install right over top of it and it installs a new grub and each time I get a different one. So depending on what <laughs> distribution I have installed on my test drive, I got a new grub loader. So so one way I've worked around it is what I do is I tell it to install its bootloader when they don't give me the option onto my USB drive. And then I'll just pull the USB drive out, obviously, when I'm done rebooting ah. and there's no grub overwrite written there. Um, but what will happen is you have to go in and kind of update your disk because it will create a UID, UUID for that USB drive thinking there's a grub on it and it'll put it in there. So it'll just give you a minor error when you're booting into Manjaro and it goes past it, but you can go and remove that out. But that's how I've gotten around it. But to me, I kept thinking, you know, this needs to be a standard that Linux distribution set to say, give people this option because distro hopping is a thing. It's not like some fad. Like if you go to <laughs> Linux, you're going to be hopping distros, man. You know, it's just part of the whole, the whole joy of Linux in a lot of ways um, is being able to try all the different flavors. Of things. So I really hope they do add something for that because there's probably advanced users know of ways to get around it. But for simple folk like me, uh, it's kind of nice to have that option real, real clear and present. So I don't make a mistake. Right. Well, like I said, I don't even, put it to the USB. So you, you've gotten way farther than I have myself. So maybe uh, they'll put it in the ubiquity. I, but you know what? To be honest with you, uh, it seems like they're in a direction where they want to more so take features out than add them into the installers. They want to make them uh, distribution de independent. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter which one that you install. So they may not be too keen on adding features like that. But who knows? We'll see. We'll see. All right. So we got some Ubuntu GNOME news. What do you think? 
we talking about the desktop dock? We are. We're take, talking about the dock or the not so dock, depending on how you look at it. So, this are you is, a dock user? Are you one of those that have to have the dock? I am a dock user. I, have I to love have the dock. docks, man. Yeah. <laughs> Plank was my go to dock. If Definitely. I'm on KDE, I use Latte Dock, which, by the way, is coming out with a new release in a week or so. Awesome. So that will be uh, really nice. And we should probably cover that when it comes out. But, um, this is a direct quote from the guys. And after a lot of back and forth, and based on our user surveys results, we're going to use an always visible dock like experience as an, as a gnome shell extension by default. However, we won't push all the features that dash to dock has part of our common uh, design principles, but working with this extension upstream that we have already contacted and worked with to ensure we don't diverge the code base. So basically what they're saying is, I guess they're going to be using a dock, but it's not going to be dash, dash to dock. Now they do say that you can install dash to dock alongside of this and use dash to dock if you would like, but it's, and that's going to, I, I forget what the results of the survey were. That's too were. many docs. 80%. 80% of the users wanted a doc. Yes. Um, said they'd find dash to doc extension useful. So, I mean, it's overwhelming uh, to hear that that many people want it and utilize it. And I think that makes sense. I mean, ultimately it's, way more convenient in launching your applications and it is part of a user experience. It's obviously one that most people who may not be as familiar with Linux may attribute the dock type feeling to Mac OS, the very simplified docs and things that they have. Elementary OS was one of the first distros I ever played with back yep. in the day that had the, the really beautiful dock uh, experience. So I, I like it. I think it's quick. It's fast. The only issue I have is sometimes those docs do get in the way and the and this happened whether it was um, you know in Windows and Mac and I've had this happen in Linux where the dock doesn't disappear even when you set it to when you want it to at certain times <laughs> and it can get pretty annoying you know so there are those type of things that get annoying with docs but for the most part they're way more convenient than they are. Yep, and I think everybody's going in that general d direction because even Solus uh, added to the budgie desktop where you can have the panel mode or the dock mode and you can it just basically acts like plank so I think that's a, a general direction everybody's heading into what programs do you have in your dock Rocco right what are the ones you have to have ready to go right now I have chrome did I say chrome oh my gosh <laughs> not again oh my god <laughs> uh, Thunderbird <laughs> Uh, the right. file manager, um, the settings manager, because I like to tweak settings, the terminal, yeah. Mate, or not Mate tweak, uh, the tweak tool, and Telegram. Nice. That's a good selection there. Good selection of tools. Mine are mostly based on the YouTube video stuff, so OBS, Audacity, um, Krita. Well... Yeah. I like all, the, all my fast tools that I like to get in and make a video with. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I mean, I, I like having a dock, but I don't want it so filled with everything. You know, it's not <laughs> everything is needed there in the kitchen sink. You know what I mean? Yeah. Some things should be in the menu. It's just the, the ones you use most regularly. So Now, do you ever do the shortcut keys? Because I've not done that with Linux, and I hear a lot of people like to set up all of these secret keys that you press that launch things. And Dude, I'm a simple guy, man. <laughs> I would not even remember the shortcut keys that I would set. So I would You'd set them all. Stick it notes I'm on telling you, I would. I'd have a cheat sheet alongside just to have the, the keyboard shortcuts. So no, that's not, I mean, I know, I know, uh, that's part of one of the updates for Ubuntu Mate where you have the super plus one where you can launch or switch to Windows and stuff like that. And Unity was able to do that, but that's just too much for me, man. <laughs> You're like, no thanks. <laughs> too much. I'll just click. I look, I just yeah. want to use my computer, you know? <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. All right. So what are you, a left or right for the window close and minimize buttons? Which well, do you prefer? There's, there's really only one answer to this. All normal human beings want it on the left. Everybody else <laughs> wants it on the right. <laughs> all, all the sparky Linux users <laughs> would want it on the right. That's just wrong. I'm sorry. That is just wrong. Having fun. <laughs> well, we've been trained over the years by Microsoft to have all the window, the close buttons on the right. And 
I completely prefer to have the window, the close and minimize. Well, actually, I prefer the close on the left and the minimize on the right because I really only use the close. Uh, I don't minimize that often. Mm -hmm. uh, so I prefer it to be clean the way GNOME originally had it. So after much debate and after their user feedback, uh, they have decided, hold on, wait for it. Drum roll. Where's the drum roll? That's as good as I got. Kill him. <laughs> <laughs> the special effects on this show. I'm telling you. It's a high budget. quality show here. Yeah. Uh, the window controls will be on the right by default right. in 1710. So right. I guess, I mean, I don't know. I guess if you're trying to go for the people that are uh, oh, coming Oh, so it's over, just the window control. It's just like the window control. Like the minimize controls. and expand, that's yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, that's that makes sense. It should be on the right then. What? Yeah. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, minimize and all that always is on the right. The close is on the left. Yeah, well, it is. All of them will be in one spot over on the right. So Okay. Close, well, minimize, maximize, they're all going to be on the right. I feel like that's something you get used to really quick. Well, yeah, because it's muscle memory from using Windows for so many years, but yeah. it's not something I prefer. So, But... You can easily change it to put it on the left, too, so it's no big deal. This is Linux, you know. It's not Windows. Yeah. That's <laughs> kind of the great part about Linux is that all these news, everyone's like, you read the comments, and they're so mad, and you're like, dude, just change it. Dude. Right. Right. Click and move it. <clears throat> yeah. So what's what else is going on? We've got Wayland confirmed as a default for Ubuntu 17.10. What? I feel like I'm in the twilight zone here because didn't we just hear they didn't or back in the day didn't want anything to do with Wayland and now they're back? Is that what I'm getting? Well, okay. I'm not a big Wayland fan, not because of Wayland's terrible or anything, but and and I probably would be a Wayland fan if I could get it to actually run with NVIDIA, but seeing as how NVIDIA does not support Wayland. Um, I never am able to try anything uh, that has a that has Wayland as default, and that includes things like Fedora. So Yeah, I had a great experience. Tell me that. about it, dude. <laughs> Talk to me. So Fedora was one of my distributions of the week that was a complete disaster to try out. Oh, and, my gosh. Uh, I run an NVIDIA 1080, uh, so I assume that has something to do with the Wayland interface, but I thought I booted in, it looked beautiful, but it was very slow. And I would move my mouse, and no matter how fast I moved it, it would just kind of tick. And then it would stay and then randomly tick all the way across. And so I was like, well, I'll use the keyboard. So I start tabbing across and typing in my name, but when I'd hit D once, it would type it like 16 times. And then the whole thing would just freeze and all these problems really getting through the menu, but I stuck with it for over an hour and got it installed you are by my man. keyboard. And it still had the problem after I went to the terminal, did all the updates and tried to get things to work. And it was probably a setting where I'd have to go in there and I guess turn it back to X if you can. I don't know if you can in, in uh I'm not just through Fedora. I don't yeah. know if you can in Fedora, but uh, I pretty much just give it up. I'm like, it's really not worth that much effort. So I'm not a uh, I'm not a Fedora guy, and I don't. I think I installed it one time and just didn't even do anything with it. So I can't help you there, brother. Now you wear fedoras, but you're not a exactly, <laughs> my lady. <laughs> Well, they are going to make uh, 1710 will ship with Wayland as the default session. And the reason behind this is so that they can get the the bugs worked out by the LTS 1804. So there will still be an Xorg session. So you still will be able to log in uh, under X and anybody that has NVIDIA will have to do that. But the option is there by default to run Wayland. So there you go. It says Ubuntu will still have an X session available out of the box, ready to roll or a click or two away. And that's what scares me. <laughs> I don't know what because, that means, dude. <laughs> because when I was trying to click in Fedora, it took a long time. So hopefully they figure out a way to make it roll because th this is a, a constant struggle I have. And, and you know, I've, I've fought this struggle on my channel is, Linux is wonderful for old equipment. We all get it. 
Yep. But it's great for the latest and greatest. But if you're going to make that case, which I have successfully with Manjaro and Ubuntu, by the way, um, you've got to keep it that way. You can't just start saying, well, we're not going to support NVIDIA because they didn't update their driver. So everybody with the 1080 is out and good luck. I mean, that's just not going to work. So you've, you've got to, I feel like they need to stop supporting some of these machines that are so old, they belong in a museum and really start focusing like Fedora is a major distribution. This is a, a big distribution and you, you cut out your entire NVIDIA population. That makes no sense. Well, uh, Fedora is always on the cutting edge of, of everything. So that's why they went to the De- Wayland as default. So yeah. uh, hopefully NVIDIA gets on the stick soon and starts working with them guys so that they can get everything worked out because it is, it is alienating a lot of people. So. I mean, NVIDIA has a history of supporting Linux. In fact, I think on some of the foundations, they donate to Linux foundations regularly. They were one of the first ones to release Vulkan drivers out there. This isn't a company that ignores Linux. There are a lot of companies out there where we can say, oh, this company just doesn't care or whatnot. But NVIDIA has not ignored Linux in any stretch of the imagination. They've provided regular updates for their drivers. I feel like they're forcing NVIDIA into a place where they're they're not comfortable going yet and we're we're pushing them there and you may alienate a lot of people if your distribution requires a click that takes 40 minutes to get to to go back to an x session and ubuntu needs to be very careful here because one of the things i'll always say about ubuntu is it's the universal tool to work on anything like it it doesn't yes. matter what ubuntu will install if you've i've screwed up my computer so bad in the past nothing would work but ubuntu would boot and so I, I really hope they keep that reputation of, of being being compatible across the board. Yep, you're right. They do have that reputation, and this will, uh, well, we'll have to wait and see till it plays out. Maybe yeah. by that time they will have something set up Before, to where you can uh, do something specific, like one click, like they said. Who knows? Yeah. Now, before I'd installed Fedora... I wouldn't have worried about the story at all. But after that experience, I'm like, eh, this could be bad. So we'll see. All right. So what, what do we got? We got GNOME Disks. Uh, the partition manager in GNOME is gaining some features that it needs. So now, and it's not out yet, but it's going to be hopefully in 3.26 GNOME that they're going to gain resize and repair support. So you'll be able to resize partitions as well as running a file system repair on your drive. So now, is this something we really needed? Can, can, what's wrong with Gparted? Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with Gparted, and I think Gparted is the go-to uh, anytime you want a, a rock-solid uh, partition manager, you're going to pull up Gparted. Mm-hmm. I, I just think this is their way of uh, trying to make their uh, tool more full-featured. Let's go deep here for a minute, Rocco. Let's go deep. Is this an issue where I I hear people talking about this within the Linux community? I hear the whispers in my ear of, you know, we have so many people going off and spinning off things. Reinventing the wheel would be the perfect example for it. So would those resources have been better spent? Maybe two or three people developed this. I don't know. Maybe 50 did. But let's say two or three people worked on this. Wouldn't their resources have been better spent working on Gparted and enhancing its features then spinning off their own completely different tool. Well, you bring up a good point. And that is, in a bigger sense, what a lot of people will say about, for example, things like Pop! OS, where don't you think that the uh, they could have contributed to the community already and maybe helped upstream with GNOME rather than create their own distro? So, yeah, that is a valid question. Uh, but... Linux is always about forking things and this person wants to do it this way. This person wants to do it that way. Um, They have different, different goals uh, to set out to go to. And yeah, in a perfect world, it would be awesome if we could all get together and create a one great distribution, Mm -hmm. one great tool. Uh, It's just, I think we're a long way away from that. So I think that this kind of goes, and I'm skipping a little bit down, but this goes into the market share of Linux. So there's been a lot of articles recently about Linux market shares. And 
one of those articles specifically was talking about uh, gaming in Linux, and one was just talking about overall Linux kind of share in the market. And the good news is, for the most part, the Linux distribution share is increasing, but we're still talking like half a percent yes. of a 2% market. And what was really interesting in some of the articles is talking about that they think we're actually taking more users from Mac than we're taking from Windows, meaning Mac's market share is dropping, whereas Windows is gaining specifically with 10 because it was free and all of that. Windows did that very calculated. Whereas uh, Mac OS is starting to shrink back, and that probably has to do with some of their very um, questionable ideas with dongles and their MacBook Pros and just not really having anything out there to compete with the latest computers out there. But I think that, you know, if you really want to see Linux take a major market share, which we all want to a degree, we want Linux to become popular enough to get the AAA titles when you talk about its uh, percent of gamers that are using it on Steam. You want it popular enough to get your friends to be able to switch to it. You're going to have to create some, especially when you're talking about Vulkan and things like that coming out as well, you're going to have to start creating some cohesion between these different groups. I think it's perfectly fine to go out there and create your own spins and different things like that, but completely focusing resources on respinning the same tool that works perfectly fine as it is <laughs> and everybody already loves just seems like, why? Um, and, and that's maybe where there needs to be some standards. Like in networking, we have standards that we set to say all networks have to run on this certain schematic. Any manufacturer can go make it, but your installation has to be done this way. And that standard creates some ability for the field to not be some chaotic mess where nobody's equipment works with anybody else's. And I feel like in in Linux, that's kind of needed. Now, I, when I first got into Linux, I understood that as Linus Torvaldus kind of being that one from a kernel standpoint to pick what goes into the kernel, what doesn't, and kind of becomes that gatekeeper for standards. But I think that needs to expand into some of the desktop environments and GUIs and programs so that people can take it a little more serious. Well, I think it's already fragmented to the point where I don't know if we're going to be able to rein it in. Okay. Uh, But as far as the, yeah, there probably should be some set of standards. I just don't know what the best way to get there is because (laughs) everybody has a different idea. Everybody has a, a, like I said, different goal. So I don't know where you, uh, who, who I guess is my question, who would be the, the people to set those standards? canonical of course no. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's where you would have your issues you would have people uh, upset about who was in control of those standards and there's where you would have the forks and you know there's where you would have the problems if we could get a a, a, a group that would maybe set standards and everybody follow that would be great but you'd have to have a unanimous decision Pipe dream. on that yeah maybe I think, though, if if Linux is going to take a desktop, obviously Linux has major market shares outside of personal desktops. Right. But for it to be really taken seriously from a personal desktop standpoint, all I'm talking about, I think some of those standards probably need to be developed outside of desktops and server world Linux owns. So you never see those percentages given out, right? Right. Everybody... Every major corporation is using it. And in fact, many big businesses that I've been working with recently are looking for open source varieties of everything from SQL servers to the word processors they use and all these things they've been paying millions of dollars for seats for licenses for individual users. So naturally, when you start looking for that, where do you start looking at an operating system? You're starting to turn towards the Linux world. So I think there's a lot of excitement there, but I think some of these news items drive me nuts because I'm like, are we doing this again? Why are we changing something that already works? <laughs> but maybe there's a good reason. I'm just not aware. Let's well, hope about it. Who knows? Uh, hopefully we get an answer someday, but um, we'll get now, it in the comments <laughs> for now. Oh yeah. We'll get some comments on that. I can tell you that. <laughs> I'm just a people pleaser this week, Rocco. You know it. <laughs> 
All right, so we do have the Ubuntu 16.04.3 LTS released. So it has it features a new hardware enablement stack, uh, which is basically pulling in the newest kernel, which I believe is 4.10, and the newest Mesa version, which is 17.0. So this also allows for some, you know, people to have that have newer cards to have some updates and maybe have some features enabled on their card. But it also means that some AMD people who use AMD cards may have some things broken. So what do you think? Well, I thought I saw in the article, they mentioned Vega specifically. And that, as I recall, is AMD's new GPU architecture. Yes, it is. So, I mean, this is, this is a major ordeal because, uh, 1604.3 1604.3 is getting that Vega support from an LTS, right? Yep. This is great. This is kind of what we were talking about when it comes to compatibility and having that compatibility on the latest and greatest stuff as well as the old thing. I mean, this card hasn't even hit the market, I think. It may be coming out this week or just launched this week and it's on the market, but uh, already making sure that their LTS users, those who want that long-term support, are able to use the latest hardware that's the way you should be doing it, in my opinion. Well, it's going to have support for the newer Vega, but it's also going to alienate some of the older AMD GPUs. So, yeah. But you have to. We can't keep supporting Goodwill computers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you well, got to focus okay. your and, attention But there's, two, there's, there's many like trains of thoughts on that, too. There are a lot of people that only have older computers. And if you start alienating them, you will lose a lot of the Linux users who uh, maybe run Linux because Windows is too slow on their older machines. So they run a Linux version, a light one, uh, like Mate or or MX16 or something like that. So you may be alienating them and, you know, to satisfy the people that have the newer and greatest cards. And that's and like I said, that's great that they're supporting uh, the newer cards. It's just a it's a I don't know. It's a hit and miss. Yeah. I mean, there's got to be a line though, right? I can't be sitting here with this Packard Bell I picked up for $10 at Goodwill (laughs) going, oh man, I got Linux to run. It's got 200 megabytes of storage. I mean, at a certain point, you got to cut it off and say, yeah, I get you have old hardware and you like running with it, but there are other operating systems we can get to run on ARM chips. We can get to run on a uh, very low powered machine, Raspberry Pi, for instance, there are certain mm-hmm. varieties of Linux you can get to run on that. And it's amazing what it can do. Don't get me wrong. But when you're talking about major distributions like this, there's got to be a cutoff point where you say, okay, if we're going to have a desktop variety and you're downloading the desktop variety, if you want to have like a ARM processor, lightweight variety option two, you got to cut things off and not keep trying to support it because when I came into Linux, that was what everyone was talking about. Like, dude, you I can't wait till you get your old <laughs> Dell Optiplex revived. And I'm like, what? Let's put this thing on a, on a real computer and it soars, it sings. And that's really what I want. So I love that they're supporting the latest and greatest hardware because that allows also game developers then to say, well, if I want to release for Linux, I'm not going to have to worry about 16 distros not working at all. And now I have to support them in my forums because their distro decided not to include drivers for the latest AMD or drivers for the latest NVIDIA. This stuff matters. You know, the support from releasing a game is one of the most expensive things out there. And so if they have to worry about the fact they're going to release a Linux version and there's 260 different distributions that they're going to have people flaming them about not working on. This is a problem, which well, is why you'll see in a lot of Steam pages that support it, they specifically only say Ubuntu. Yep. Well, I mean, you have that with uh, just plain general software. There's a lot of people that don't want to take the time to support all of the different distributions, and that's why really Snaps is so important, so that they wouldn't have to support... 10 different distributions they could do it in one but i but even a couple months ago you seen the trend where arch was going away from 32 bit computers mm-hmm. uh, and i'm sure you will see that as time goes on that yeah you're right it has to move forward um it just like i said it's a two it's a double edged sword because you do leave people behind so definitely yep all right so what do we got next man 
Mozilla's new fire file sharing feature. So Mozilla apparently is doing a test pilot with some experimental tools. I told you not to count Mozilla out, Rocco. <laughs> I can't believe, by the way, that you're brazen enough to use their free mail service, but don't use their browser. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> there, you said you use Thunderbird. I do. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but you use Chrome. <laughs> hey, don't if, you lie to hey, me. Hey, if Chrome had a, uh, a desktop email client, I, m- I might use it. Of course you would. <laughs> and Google would love you for it. Because it would probably be better than Thunderbird. Oh, my gosh. Mm. The Man, hate. Did I say oh, that? It hurts. No, I'm just saying. Oh, people pleasing. Look, look, that's one spot where the Linux desktop sorely needs something. They need a desktop email client. I know that there's the whole train of thought that everybody uses webmail now, but there's there are a lot of people that use a desktop client. It's true. And Thunderbird is basically the only stable option. Sure, you have Evolution and Geary and stuff like that. Uh, Elementary is working on their mail client. But tried and true, stable, really all you have is Thunderbird. Agreed. And you hate the themes on that probably too because it's not a very theme-friendly Were we talking client. about Atlantis Marset earlier? <laughs> yeah, because that's <laughs> what 90s. it looks like. Yeah. But I, I do agree. It is definitely the best one available at this time. But Mozilla is doing some new file sharing here, which is, even though it's not Mozilla, it's interesting because when I was doing my website stuff, I use Fire FTP, which is actually just a plugin within Mozilla to allow you to upload files to a server. But there was this big question to me of, man, I don't know who makes Fire FTP. Is this even safe that I'm sending my files over here? So I think it's cool that Mozilla is doing some branding of their own tools here, it seems like. And so they've got a test pilot for a uh, FTP file sharing uh, service that says secure. So I assume it's SFTP probably if we looked in there. It is encrypted. I don't know what the actual encryption is. Um, Mm -hmm. So basically you install the test pilot add-on and then you go to send.firefox.com, drag your file onto there and it generates a link and you can copy and share that link. So that link is valid for 24 hours or until it's downloaded once, which is cool, which is, which is really cool. So once that happens, 24 hours or that person downloads that file, whichever happens first, then the upload is completely deleted and it's gone forever. Well, maybe not forever, but I mean, there's, it's always there somewhere, but you know what I mean. That's the idea. The CIA has a copy. Yeah, of, of course it. the CIA has a copy, but <laughs> uh, that's the idea that it is secure. Uh, so I can send you uh, a, the, one of my music files or whatever. You can download it and bam. So you're saying this is a new way to pirate? No, absolutely not. We are against <laughs> pirating. I'm just saying. <laughs> Uh, that's interesting. I wonder if they'll come across issues with that because before you said music file, I hadn't thought about that use of it. So that, that will be interesting. Well, this brings up a, a question of what will it be used for? And, you know, can people, you know, who is it? Is any, I mean, obviously it's encrypted, but I mean, that opens the door for anybody to send anything, including illegal stuff. So that's true. Yep. So speaking of Firefox, they're back in the news again. Well, Mozilla launching an experimental voice search, file sharing and note taking. So they're, I guess they're adding to the file sharing and adding voice search and built in note taking on there. So I think Mozilla's kind of getting the message out there. I think they listened to uh, Destination Link's prior episode and saw some of the market share dropping and got some new tools here, man. What do well, you think? I don't know. They uh, it's it's a plugin, I guess, and what it does is it adds a little voice icon to that. your uh, DuckDuckGo search, your Google search. I think Google already has one, but uh, there's a couple other search engines that it works with, and you can use your voice to search with it. So I don't know. Is that something that you would even use? Maybe not, but I can see certainly people who have disabilities would definitely find that extremely useful. Um, maybe if you're, you know, utilizing, uh, your computer as a media center or something along those lines, being able to activate the voice search would be advantageous over having to use keyboard. Uh, so maybe they're thinking outside of just the monitor screen and looking at other, uh, uses for that. So I, I just like to see that Mozilla is 
out there experimenting, trying new things and added new features, which uh, I think is pretty cool. I'll be checking out. So, sure. Yeah. What about you? Well, I, I don't know if I'll be using the uh, voice search because I don't even use that on my phone. Uh, but, yeah, I'm not a fan of it either. Uh, I'm not a big fan of that, but I will be trying out the Firefox Send. So, Cool. All right, so let's do some gaming news, man. What do you have in the gaming department? Let's see. Well, we talked about uh, gaming market share in there, but one thing I thought was really cool is one of the big developers out there, of course, is Epic Games. When you think about Epic Games, one of their big games that are out there, if you watch Twitch right now, a lot of Twitch uh, streamers are playing this game. It's called Fortnite. Of course, you got Paragon, you got Unreal Tournament. So this is a this is a pretty big developer. This is a big deal. And the new story here is Epic Games is planning to use Vulkan by default for the Unreal Engine on Linux. So uh, I think this is super exciting. And what I was predicting in a lot of my videos with regarding gaming on Linux and Vulkan that Vulkan is going to start being. Uh, something that people are going to be defaulting to outside of DirectX because it allows you so much more cross-platform uh, ability to deliver your game. You know, cross Well, that's what I was going to ask you. What exactly does using Vulkan by default give somebody? Like, how does that help somebody? Well, the way I understand Vulkan is Vulkan is going to uh, basically allow it as an API for the developer to release their game without having to code all the individual graphic and callbacks to your graphic card and all of that for each individual system. For instance, the callback, if Android uses Vulkan and your computer uses Vulkan and your Xbox used Vulkan and your PS4 used Vulkan, then I can release one game with that API in there versus having to write one for every single console or distribution. So now as a developer, it doesn't require me as much time to be able to make my game for each individual platform. So now maybe I'm thinking, well, I'm only going to get, you know, 1,500 sales if I switch to Linux is what I'm estimating. Well, I don't have enough money to take two of my people full time to make them develop these APIs for Linux to go do that. But now with Vulkan, I could just design it with one and now I don't have to worry about it. That's the idea that I've seen uh, people talk about behind Vulkan and what it can bring to Linux. And I think that's what you're starting to see here because DirectX obviously has the monopoly on everything, but a lot of these companies are looking multi-platform now. They're, they're looking beyond just Windows. And I think you can see big when big developers like Epic Games starts making those decisions, that matters. When Bethesda did it with Doom and moved to Vulkan, that mattered. That was a big deal. So we're starting to see that evolve. Well, that is awesome news then, because look, you, we talk about the market share. We t we're still really, really low. So anything we can mm -hmm. do to uh, have people, number one, develop for Linux and mm -hmm. to make it easier for them. That that's the way we need to go because you know we we talk about little games. I mean, we're talking <laughs> point point point. You know what I mean? Right. It's like we need everything we can get. So that's that's awesome news. Yeah, I, I think so. And, and you can feel the excitement when people see gaming on Linux. And I I was really depressing that percent because I thought man, it really feels like Linux is in the air right now, doesn't it? And yep. sometimes those percents can be tricky. You know, numbers lie and liars love numbers. You never know who they pulled, you know, did they go to a Microsoft building to run their pool? Who knows right. what they're what it's all based on. But I can, I can tell you that it sure feels like Linux is growing. And I see so many people just on my small channel that come and say, hey, I saw you gaming doom or using these other games in Linux and I'm switching, I'm downloading Manjaro right now, or I'm switching to Linux right now. So I feel like people are really starting to get that message and uh, I'm hoping more big uh, companies that are producing these AAA games that people are wanting to play. And Twitch is a big deal here to target, yep. I think um, because what people see being played on Twitch, they're going to want to play. And if you can't play it on Linux, they're going to not probably not use Linux or they're just going to, um, some may dual boot if they want to experiment, but a lot of people will just stay away from it. 
Right. Uh, what else we got in the game and news? Well, have you ever had a problem creating a shortcut? <clears throat> excuse me for Steam games on your desktop. Well, I haven't until I read the article and then I tried it and it failed. <laughs> Can you imagine? That? And I was like, wow, I didn't realize this didn't work because I think I've always created my manual. Well, apparently there is a bug uh, that is on the GitHub page as well. So for Valve, they, so they know about it, but it tries to create a shortcut and you get an error stating that it couldn't create the shortcut because it's already there, even yep. though it's really not there. So there is, you know, obviously the workaround is to create the shortcut manually and it's not a huge deal, but in case you've been having that issue and it's been racking your brain, why won't this shortcut be made? Then here you go. It's an actual bug and they are, I guess they know about it and hopefully they'll be fixing it soon. So, yeah, that seems like something that will be a pretty easy fix uh, to have. It's just calling to something and seeing a path that doesn't exist. Famous last oh. words, easy fix. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Anytime I've ever said that in my work, it's always become a disaster. So um, there's also some more things, you know, talking about AAA titles and Linux, Arc is uh, definitely one that was a major title to come for Linux. Arc was super popular on Twitch. Every streamer I you could watch was pretty much streaming arc when it first came out and it's still very popular. They've got lots of tournaments and things like that going out, but it looks like there's some bad news here, Rocco, that the survivor survival evolved full release is delayed until the end of August. Yes. That's good. It's not good, but it may be for the better in the long run. Mm -hmm. So they put out a, a press release and they basically said they're going to push back until August 29th and they're really apologetic and they're really sorry. That's still not going to stop people from being upset about it. But look, if at the end it's going to produce a better final product, it's better to push it back than to release it and have it be completely full of bugs and not ready. Yeah. So if you've been waiting for that, uh, just know that it will be delayed. You know, this is a matter of resources, too. I, I read the comments in this article, and there was a lot of people very mad at ARC for this. But, you know, you got to give ARC some credit, the fact that they took a AAA title and put it on Linux pretty quickly uh, out there from the initial release. And they are focusing on a console release right now. So a lot of their developers are being focused on that. And you got to think from a business perspective, you know, if you've got major consoles and contracts and things going on over there, you've got to make sure that works and they're going to get back to the Linux version. It's not like they said, Oh, sorry, we're not even going to mess with it. They, they give us dates and things that they're going to get back. And I'm okay with it personally, but I'm not a huge arc player. So I can imagine if someone was competitive in arc and using Linux, very frustrating. I get it. But at the same time, when you understand all the things going on in their business, you kind of see why they make the decision. Yeah, it doesn't bother me in the least because I don't play Arc. But yeah, you're right. For the people that do play, uh, it's probably going to be a big, uh, a big deal. Yep. All right. So, have so, you ever heard of Downward? I have not. That's not been on my radar. But uh, the, the screenshots of it look kind of cool. One of those puzzle games. I'm not a puzzle game guy. You're not Are a you puzzle, a puzzle game. game guy. I, I actually like puzzle games, uh, adventure games, challenges. Sometimes they they make them so difficult that it's ridiculous that you need a walkthrough to watch while you're playing the game. <laughs> but this is a parkour, parkour, parkour game, kind of like uh, Mirror's Edge. And uh -huh. you basically run around and are jumping off of walls and whatnot and uh, finding things, solving puzzles. And it actually looks pretty good. So... And guess what? It's going to have a Linux version. <laughs> Bam! It better if it's on this channel. That's right. Yeah. Big news. So it's now on pace to be released. It's It has early access, or it will have early access, and the Linux version will be along with the early access. So I think it's a game that we should probably check out, and maybe, who knows, yeah. um, talk about Please. it in the future. Or maybe we'll do a live stream. There you go. If we really like it, if we really, really like it. So this is an interesting article here. Uh, 
the CIA's Ares malware can exfiltrate data from Linux systems. I'm, I'm assuming this has something to do with the big Edward Snowden or one of those guys releasing some of the files behind the scenes where we found out the CIA has all these tools and back doors into our systems. This is one of the many ones that they've found through that investigation. So guess what? Just because you run Linux doesn't mean everything you have is completely secure. And I think that's a very important message for individuals to know. Although I would highly doubt the CIA would spend most of their time trying to break into Linux. Well, I would imagine uh, they're going after the major distributions, but looking at their infiltration tool, what was interesting is they're targeting major server yes. editions of Linux. And yep. that's kind of scary. Well, everything runs on Linux in the server world. Okay. M not right. everything, but you know, most things run on Linux right. in the server world. So yeah. And we, we have talked about it before on the show that, you know, you can't tell me that they don't have anything to get through on Linux. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not like uh, the bad guys are out there and the CIA is going, okay, we got them, they're on Windows. And then they go, then the bad guy switches to Linux and all of a sudden, oh, oh we, can't, yeah. <laughs> we can't do nothing now. <laughs> I mean, you know, obviously they, they are going to have tools, even ones that we don't even know about. And you hear little bits and pieces every week come out, comes out of something that, you know, oh, well, this, this is on Linux, this is on Linux. So, Linux is way more secure than Windows or, or anything else, but it's not foolproof. And if they want it, they can get it. If they want it bad enough, definitely. And this kind of goes back to the iPhone case. If you remember, there was an iPhone case. It was terrorist-related, which pulled at a lot of people's heartstrings. But Apple refused to go in and create a backdoor into their phone. And the whole idea, of course, was the issue is that the Apple encrypts the actual storage on their device. So I would imagine if the CIA physically has your system, they're still going to be able to crack it. But this does leave a case to something Dustin would probably say, which is, are you encrypting your hard drive? Because <laughs> even if they could infiltrate your system, if your files are encrypted, they're going to have one heck of a time trying to get into it. So there, are, even though... Linux is more secure. It's not impenetrable. Nothing is. And uh, eventually somebody could get in if they want it bad enough. But there are steps you could take to make it far more difficult for them to have any real success when they're there. So, uh, you know, for the most part, they're going to look at your stuff, realize you're encrypting it. And unless you're on the most wanted list, probably move on to the guy who doesn't encrypt anything and runs Windows without patching it for six months. You know, pretty much just an easier target, <laughs> just an easier target. <laughs> Well, look, the moral of the story is keep your systems updated and just know that, you know, if they want it bad enough, they can get it. Yep, absolutely. Well, look, man, I think that is the end of the news. So let's uh, let's plug the Telegram group. And the guys in the Telegram group uh, were talking the other day and the conversations vary from, uh, you know, kitchen sinks <laughs> to <laughs> to Linux di distributions to IT infrastructure. So I would encourage you to join the Telegram group and uh, join in the chat. You can find them at destinationlinux.org and you can find the Telegram group at destinationlinux.org slash Telegram. You can also visit the uh, Patreon page if you would like and that is patreon.com slash destinationlinux. So what are you going to be doing this week, man? What are you up to? Well, you know, like I said, I'm going to be doing some iPad repairs out there, which will be a little bit of a break from some of the uh, normal stuff I've been doing on the channel. We're going to get Chad back in. He's going to be finishing up uh, his, another video and doing some more detailed animations within Linux uh, using Blender and Torque. So that will be on the channel, which will be part of our game development series out there. Um, we're also uh, going to be doing some enhancements. You know, the website that I, I built using Linux, of course, Brackets and Krita and some other tools out there. We're going to have some folks uh, who have they've already contributed some code on the community documents. We're kind of making it like an open source website. Nice. And we're going to be implementing some of that code that they've provided to enhance the website out there. So we've got all kinds of cool stuff we're doing with Linux. 
But the most exciting part, Rock. What's the most exciting part? Likely, likely, if you guys tune in to one of our channels, we are going to be streaming some terrible rocket. <laughs> we have plans on getting together and doing another stream of Rocket League. And it was so exciting to see the one comment that we got from that <laughs> stream. And it was, you probably better stick to customization videos. <laughs> <laughs> but we had a blast and uh i don't really care about the comments so we're we're going to well, actually we were also playing with a pro too it's important yeah. to to know we were playing with a pro and we were forced into pro level playing because outside of that me and rocco kill it we, we rock just so you yeah. know <laughs> i've like got three goals three different games but i've gotten like three goals hey man we're getting better that's our story and we're sticking to it that's right so we'll, we'll be uh that. yeah we'll be streaming some rocket league soon so all right well that'll be it for this episode uh, we thank you all for watching and we hope you have a great week and remember the journey itself is just as important as the destination Thanks, Rocco. Thanks, everyone. See ya. Thank you for listening to another episode of Destination Linux Podcast.